Hey everybody, you're listening to the production channel. My name is Stephen Bowles and I got Clem Harrod with me. Hello, Clem. What's going on, man? Chatter, chatter. Hey, buddy. Eh, not doing too bad. I was uh, hanging out over at Epcot this weekend. Uh, yeah, I saw you there. Festival. I saw you. I know. <laughs> that was, <laughs> that was pretty too. random. That was exciting. Out of all the tens of thousands of people that were getting uh, their drink on, all of a sudden I see this tall dude walking towards me, and I'm like, that is so Clem right there. <laughs> <laughs> Smile on my face, hanging out with my wife, sister-in-law, and brother-in-law. It was great times, man. You got to love the Food yeah, & Wine dude. Festival. I know. Well, uh, for anyone new who's listening, this is the production channel where we're, really we just kind of cover all topics production, anything from audio, video, lights, uh, vendor, supplier, all things. We just kind of uh, get together and, and try to capture those stories that are going on around in the industry because I know it's very, very busy out there uh, and we don't always get a chance to catch up. So uh, today I'm really, really excited uh, to have Joe Mertz uh, joining us today. Welcome, Joe. Hello, everybody. Glad to be here. Hey, yeah. Um, so just a little bit of background on Joe. He is the CEO of Merch Productions and Merch Crew, of which we'll be covering both of those today. Um, but really, he's got 15 years of uh, experience producing his own shows through Merch uh, Productions. And then really before that was even, you know, just kind of freelancing uh, for years before that. So I guess just 20 plus years total, which is awesome. That's the kind of stuff we like to bring in here. People who have seen this industry from uh, really a lot of different sort of angles, right? Joe's been a freelancer. He's been a uh, producer. He's also been now with Merch Crew, which is exciting. More on the vendor, supplier, and kind of just uh, innovator, right? Really changing the way that we uh, interact with uh, this industry on the daily. And we're going to cover all that stuff in a little bit. But um, to get us uh, going, Clem, what, uh, real quick, give me your two, two, uh, two sentence take on why it is that we're doing what we're doing. The reason why you and I just wanted to start this thing up was because we travel so much. Our lives are just busy, crazy. But those friendships, those bonds, that information out there, when you're not in it all the time or you don't, when you're not a part of the story, sometimes it's missed and you want to just stay in the know. You want to stay in that, that bond with your fellow coworkers. You want to stay in the know of the industry, but you also want to make a difference in the industry. You also want to, to leave your mark or if somebody else is leaving their mark, you want to hear about it. You want to be a, see, understand the greater good of the, the industry and what we're doing out here. That's right, man. And that's honestly why we bring guys like Joe in, because they've done that in their own way already. And so we're excited about this. All right, so Joe, uh, I'll actually go ahead and just kick off the first question. So Joe, how in the goodness gracious, how did you find this industry? Like, how did you actually get into the production industry? That's a great question. Um, I was actually going to college for engineering, mechanical engineering in Pennsylvania. And my summer job was a, a technician at a little theme park called Sesame Place. It was based on Sesame Street. <laughs> it was a what? great summer job, uh, fabulous, you know, all teenage kids. Um, and it was such a small, small park, you got to do some amazing things. I mean, some of my colleagues were writing shows, uh, you know, performing them. Uh, we really got to do some amazing production type stuff that you would really never get at that age to do at like a, cool. a park like Disney World or, you know, Epcot where they have, you know, full on production companies. Um, yep. So I was doing the engineering thing and about halfway through I said, you know, I really don't know if I can be an engineer. I want something a little more interesting, a little more exciting. Um, and at that point I wanted to do film and TV. And I moved to Orlando because they were building sound stages and Orlando seemed to be the up and coming film TV location. Um, and then I moved down here and I realized the, the, the above the line work all came from LA and New York. So I had to either move to LA or New York if I really wanted to be a producer in film and TV. Um, so I started to look for alternatives and that's when I discovered the live event industry and my first real job in the industry was in the um, events department at Walt Disney World. I worked out of the building which was called Main Gate at the time. And I was a freelancer, I never actually had a full-time job there, but I would just pick up jobs um, uh, on a project basis, uh, 
for two years, I started, you know, doing, I started with the Boy Scout Jamboree with them as a, as a production assistant. And I finished uh, my career there with the Super Bowl halftime show in 2000 as a production assistant. And at that point I was like, it's time to move on. And I started freelancing and, you know, going out into the real world and uh, trying to pick up some work with some other production companies besides one, one specific company. Were you, hold on, you said you did get a chance to work on the Super Bowl halftime show? I did, 2000, I was I in, did not know that. Yes, I was, uh, I was the production assistant for the Super Bowl halftime show number 34 in Atlanta, Georgia. Who was uh, the, uh, who was the band? Uh, it was multiple, that was for the, the, towards the end of a huge theatrical production, but it was Christina Aguilera and Enrique Iglesias, Tony Braxton, they all had like a, a song in that, and it was a huge theatrical production. It wasn't just a band out there doing their music. It was, you know, typical Disney, huge spectacle, hundreds of people and puppets and you know pyro <laughs> and flying. I mean, you should find it. It was it was pretty amazing. It was to celebrate their millennium, which they had a whole bunch of millennium projects, and this was kind of a a, a mark a, a commercial for their millennium projects that year. I gotcha. Wow. I gotcha. You know, I, cool, I love man. how you know you. It, this seems to be a running theme, uh, Stephen, with people with, starting in Orlando and coming to Orlando. Like, what was that like? How old were you when you just decided, you know what? I just want to get up and move. I'm going to go to Orlando because they seem like they have some stuff going on down there. What did that process entail for you? Yeah, I was uh, I was 22 years old. I had just graduated college with an engineering degree, and my parents are like, "What do you mean you're not going to go get an engineering job?" <laughs> Um, what did we just pay for? Exactly. Um, so, you know, I packed up my car. It was a Chevy Corsica. I filled it up with everything that I could, I had. I actually had no bed. I slept on the, the floor for, uh, for a year and a half. Uh, but I had a, a couple of friends who all worked at Sesame Place with me. One guy was going to go to school down there. Another guy had a job at the Magic Kingdom. We had another guy that was already there. So I had a little bit of a support structure kind of it wasn't like it was just totally wide open and open-ended it was nice to have some friends to come down to and we shared a house you know help pay the rent okay. together um but it was just all of us kind of in the same area trying to figure it out and it's it's funny the number of people we actually had a party once of all the old sesame people that you know had had left sesame and come down <laughs> to disney and moved on to bigger and better things. Um, it was uh, it, it was cool, but so we, I had a little bit of a friendly support structure down here, but it was still, yeah. you know, unnerving. You know, I, I didn't have a lot of money in my pocket. I just spent, you know, money for college. My first job was at the Rainforest Cafe and then eventually the Planet Hollywood. I used to be the door host there. <laughs> so, uh, you know, you just <laughs> picked up- With a smile on the hair. I can see you meeting people. <laughs> exactly, you know, but you picked up whatever work you could get. Um, you know, to pay the bills until, you know, the, the first opportunity to work with Disney World finally came through. Hmm. Now, you talk about bigger and better things. Like when, when, I, when we were first introduced, it was through, you know, a payroll company. I was working freelancing for LMG and, you know, I had to send my invoices over to Mertz crew. And, and how, how did that come about? How did the whole Mertz crew and Mertz consulting, the difference, that how did is, that come that, about? That's an awesome story. Um, I was freelancing, you know, so after I had kind of moved on from Disney and started, you know, produ or producing some of my own shows, freelancing for some other folks, I was actually on a show as a stage manager, um, and the audio engineer there uh, was a guy named Louie Hall, who I still work with today. Um, Louie, yes, I love Louie. Louie is a <laughs> fabulous guy. Um, he, 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 we were sitting there at lunch, you know, and he was just complaining that the, the company that was processing his payment through LMG that year was, um, they, they couldn't really explain his paycheck. He was getting like a mixed rate. They didn't know how to do, you know, full 10 hour days. So they were trying to combine eight hours into two hours and they just didn't get our industry mm. at all. And uh, the, the crux of it was he had gotten his paycheck and they had taken a, a chunk of money out of his paycheck and they couldn't explain why. They just basically said, we overpaid you. You know what I mean? And he was like, so I felt for him. I'm like, that's terrible. You should, you know, you should, you should know how much money you're getting paid. You shouldn't have to, you know, it's just silly that, that this is the kind of, you have to go through. And he said, well, I have to have the, the insurances in order to do this. And I said, well, we have that. Can you just run it through us and we'll process it for you. And then you can get paid your, your full rate. 
And he looked at me and he's like, you do that? I said, absolutely. You know, it's, it's not hard. You know, let's just figure it out. So um, we talked to LMG. He said, yeah, they're willing to do it as long as you have the right paperwork. They're fine with it. I said, okay, well, here's what here's the fee we can do that for. And they said, okay, fine. And, and we, we did it. Well, Louis had kind of talked to a couple other people in the, and four guys uh, all came over at that first time and said, you know, hey, I'd like to do that too. So we had like the original four guys that were all willing to process that. Um, and, it, cool. and it was me and my wife. I was running the Mertz production side, and my wife was actually just handling the processing of all the the LMG guys, you know, for a couple of them, um, in our home office at our you know first house. And then by the end of that year, we were probably like thirty five guys. You know, they'd all started you know just moving on and saying, "I'd rather do this than that," and they all voluntarily joined us. Um, and then by the end of that year, the, the general manager at LMG basically said, could you do everybody if we just you know, <laughs> told them to do you? And we said, absolutely. So that was kind of the impetus of, you know, picking on a, a full time client, specifically running everything through us and processing for them. Um, and and was that, just, were you nervous about that, like to take on that that task? No, I mean, it was, it was, it was just more of the same of what we were doing. Um, and it didn't seem difficult to me. And I got the industry, like I understood mm-hmm. what we were doing. So we just started to implement tools to kind of make it easier. I created an Excel spreadsheet that calculated hours properly. And I remember uh, we just, <laughs> yeah, we just started. Oh, dude, it had some crazy formulas in there. Uh, it, it was. If you <laughs> and everything was locked because, so you couldn't mess it up. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. Only type in the green cell. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but we, you know, the, it, it, and the guys liked it because, you know, it was clear, it was simple. It showed them right there how much they were going to get paid. You know, that's how much their paycheck was. There was, it, we, we just simplified that process for them. Um, and everybody seemed to like it. And um, yeah, so no, it, it wasn't scary. I did at that point say I need to fire my wife because, you know, she's not, she's not going to be able to handle that much. Hold on, fire uh, her or ask her to step down? Come I on. asked her to, st- I, I moved her, I, I, I transitioned her to a new role. And, there you uh, go. <laughs> and we got Alexia on board as our full timer. And uh, she's been with us ever since. And, you know, we, we, we kind of just increased our operating expenses to help you know manage the amount of people that were were coming on board nice yeah that, that's funny i remember freelancing as well and getting the merch I, my first introduction to you was through some just like logo at the upper left corner of an excel spreadsheet I'm like, <laughs> who is this guy <laughs> that's <laughs> but, great that's you know great. that's uh, it's interesting you say that you know that basically came about because uh well not only because just you and louie and the problem there that you guys were solving but um having a big first client like you know, like an organization like an LMG or any other production company. I had the same thing when we started my, my first company. I started Eastgate Productions with a buddy and we started it by having one client out the door who uh, was on retainer for like $25,000 a month or whatever it was. But it's like, it's a lot easier to start up a new business when you've got that sort of big contract right out the gate as opposed to building it one at a time at a time at a time, which is essentially what you were able to accomplish with LMG there at the end of the year, it sounds like. Yeah, it was amazing. I mean, in fact, when he brought me in, I had no idea that's where he was going with the meeting. And he finally just was like, you know, can you do all of these? And it was like, you know, what a nice surprise. But yeah, absolutely. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> That's cool, man. So then along the way, you're doing, you're producing your own shows, right? I mean, basically you have moved from more of an individual kind of uh, show tech or whatever it is, or even just stage manager to more of Mertz Productions. Tell us, tell us about that. Like what kind of events were you actually producing? Yeah, I had, I started with, um, uh, we do a Halloween event for a local theme park. We've been doing that since 2001. Um, and then we've got some existing corporate clients, um, and we just started to grow that. And it was, I was kind of doing both. I was freelancing for some other people and I was producing my own shows and, and it got to a point where the, the, the time commitment to freelance for other people was starting to impede on the, the clients that I had. So I had to just kind of make a, a, a personal decision. Hey, no more freelancing. We're just going to focus on our clients and our clientele and, and, and go after the, you know, really nail those projects. Um, so we've been continuing to do the Halloween event for, uh, 16 years. Uh, this was our 16th year producing that event. 
Um, we've got uh, several corporate clients that we've had for multiple years. And our we've had slow growth that way, but we tend to, when we pick up a client, they're very happy with our progress and our, our the, the way we do things. And we've continued to just maintain that clientele. So um, that's kind of the slow and steady growth that I've focused on with Merch Productions is just really take care of the clients we have and make them want to continue to use us and not want to go anywhere else. And that's that's what we've been a we've been able to do. And we've even moved on. Now we do some cruise line entertainment. Uh, so we've got hot theme parks, cruise lines and corporate enter, uh, events uh, as our as our kind of our playbook of, of stuff that we produce. That's awesome. Are you uh, are you doing more just creative and stage management, or are you renting gear? Kind of like what you're uh, offering to them. Our um, my key demographic is those clients that don't have any type of production. We we pick those clients up. A lot of our corporate clients, we kind of get them as they're growing out of hotel AV. And they're getting frustrated with the lack of, of creative design or, or even just design for what they're accomplishing. You know, for years, they've just basically said, we need this equipment. And then, of course, the hotels can provide that. They grow beyond that to where they want to do things. We want to do this. We want to do that. But they have no idea how to do that. You know what I mean? We want to do a yeah. more creative or we want to do a, a morning talk show, you know, and you really can't get that from Hotel AV. You got to tell them what you need in order to produce that. So. So those are the types of clients we've gotten is just people who can't, who don't have those capabilities or within in house. And like I try to tell my clients, you guys focus on the content of what you want to say. We'll make sure it's heard and, and comes, comes across to everybody in the audience. I can't sell jeans or I can't, you know, sell timeshares or whoever the client is, but we can make sure everybody in that room hears the message that you guys are saying and it's, it's conveyed to them and then they can go out and sell and that's the value we try to we try to offer. Well, really, it's that switch from a client. You're right. With, with Hotel AV, you're more so dictating to them what you need, right? I need, you know, basic lectern with a, with a microphone and I want one, you know, screen with a whatever. Exactly. Uh, graphic computer. But once you get to that next level, really the client wants needs to be they're more in a position where they want to be told what they can do or how they could do what it is that's in their head and that's just kind of never going to happen on the hotel AV side. exactly i mean it's like you know it's the difference between saying you know i can order cameras and lights and you know an audio equipment but that doesn't mean you can make a movie out of it and especially a successful right. movie you know you anybody can get the equipment but it's the it's the way it's all put together and and, and put together to package that stuff into a live event or a movie or a TV show. That's what production is. That's yes, cool. You know, I, uh, I actually was on, so for anyone who's listening, I actually uh, came up with show flow, uh, on a Mertz show down. I've, I want to say it was like in Naples or maybe Key Biscayne. I don't even know where it was. It was the Ritz, these, these, yeah, it was the Ritz Carlton Ritz? Key Biscayne. Yep. There you go. Yeah, you <laughs> you always, your, your clients, man, you picked the right ones. You guys picked the good hotels. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, and I remember being backstage and I tell the story almost in every demo that I do with people who are interested in show flow as far as kind of backstory or whatever. But I'm always like, yeah, I was, on, you know, I'm from the industry live video director and I was on a show site and the producer or whatever, maybe it's Liesl, I don't know, came over and dropped a new version of a production cue sheet or a show flow on my switching desk. And I always had to sit there and go, all right, am I going to transfer all my notes from my old one to my new one? Or am I going to fork essentially from whatever you've got and keep my old version, but just kind of make annotations of the different? And I was like, that right there is the very reason, you know, that we went after Showflow. But I remember being on show site and telling, uh, I think Sandy was on calm. He was your show caller. And I remember popping on calm and be like, if this existed, would you, do you think this would be a good idea? And basically took a survey of everybody right there on calm. Um, and then spend some time backstage rendering out in Photoshop or like in Keynote, I forget what it was, some ideas of it and just running out to the front of house to you and to Sandy and just kind of pitching it to you guys throughout the week. So anyways, yep. I've, I have a very close co uh, connection between <laughs> merch production shows and everything that I do right now. I believe on that show too. I think you, by the, I think we had printed the show flows. And by the time yeah. Liesl had walked it back to you, I think we already had a change. So I think the very first right. thing we did was go, <laughs> okay, change number 32. Like it was the very exactly. first thing we did. It was amazing. <laughs> 
Nice. Now, 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 Joe, with all the, the changes in your lives, in your life with the production and then the, the Mertz crew, how do you just manage that family time now? What do you what do you do to stay grounded to home and your kids and stuff like that? Yeah, you know, it, it started early on. I remember when I worked out of the house before we actually had an office and, um, you know, and other employees. Um, I used to I used to work all the time, you know what I mean? And, and then mm-hmm. my, and my daughter was born and she would come to the office and stick her little toes under my office and want to get me to come out and play. And of course, how do you not, you know, stop what you're doing and, and go play with her for a little bit? Yeah. Um, but the first rule we came up with, and my wife and I was, I said, you know what? I said, if you can give me the time in the office, you know, to leave me alone, keep the kids, you know, from distracting me, I'll work until six o'clock is as much as possible, get everything I can possibly get done. And then I'll carve that out as, you know, when six o'clock comes, I'm done working, you know, and I'll go, it'll be family time at that point. And that was kind of the first rule we came up with to try and come up with a, a good delineator between family time and, and, and work time. And, and it's still hard now. I mean, your, your phones and your devices and everything is connected, but I try to mentally check out of work at six you know, and then at that point, it's just emergency stuff. It's just things that must be taken care of. But if it can wait till tomorrow during business hours, that's what I that's what I try to do and try to mentally say, you know what, let me have the time with the family. Because that's what most people do. You know, they're done their job and they go home and they're all finished, um, mm-hmm. you know, and, and, and they, you know, they, they can work on it the next day. And so you have to mentally tell yourself, I'm going to, this is family time. This is when I'm going to spend time with my family and, and stop working. And, um, cause I could, I could work 24 seven if I, yeah. if I wanted to, it, especially in this industry, it's fun. So it's, you know, sometimes it's not even a pain. You, you, you like it. You want to, you want to do it. Mm-hmm. Um, but you have to mentally tell yourself, all right, this is where, this is where the line is. I'm going to, and, and I'm only going to do emergency stuff or client facing stuff or stuff that could damage the relationship with the client. That's the only stuff I kind of worry about yeah. after hours i know it's really hard in this industry because you know for working from show to show as a tech it's like you just ch- sometimes people get caught chasing that dollar and i know um steven you had mentioned before how you had your budget you know what number you had to reach at the end of the by the end of the year and once you re- reach that number then you would kind of taper off and mm-hmm. i wonder if a lot of people do that if a lot of people truly establish a budget and understand what their operation costs are for the year to then uh, take the work accordingly so that they can have a life and, and think about their families and stuff like that. Well, I think that it, I think it does. I mean, the interesting thing with Joe here is actually you're a blend of both um, travel, right, for shows with merch productions, but then you got merch crew, which is a little bit more of a, probably a regular sort of business hour um, job. And like for me, you know, speaking from show flow, I remember when I used to travel all the time, it was fun, but it also was exhausting and it takes a toll on your personal life in terms of figuring out how to like find the norm and all that volatility. Um, but with show flow now, I literally come in, uh, work from, you know, eight to six. Now I'm working a thousand percent of my, you know, my brain is on it. But then when I'm done, I come home. I wonder for you, Joe, what do you, how do you handle that? Because you basically, might travel for a show, be on show side, have crazy odd hours. But then if you travel back on a Tuesday, that doesn't necessarily mean that you get to take the rest of the week off. You still got to go into the office on Wednesday mm, and either right, work right. on merch crew or at minimum just do normal producing sort of management roles that you have to do for the next show. So how do actually back to you, how do you handle all of that? Yeah, how do you yeah. do both? Well, I, and I, I, the same way I try to compartmentalize the business hours, I also then when I'm on a show that's a long run or a decent amount of time, I try to then tell like the kids will, especially if I'm traveling a lot, you can, the kids are just, oh, don't go. And they, you know, it really takes a toll on them. But then we try to have family time. We, we try to travel together or we go visit family or we go on a vacation or we go on a cruise. And I try to explain to them, you know, we we get a good quality amount of time together, you know, then when we, you know, when we can spend time together, if I can get a day off from the office and surprise them, you know, or, or I can come home early, I'll try to do that. Um, but it's just mentally compartmentalizing when you're working and then when you're not working to really try and, and honestly, my favorite time is when I have a Saturday, 
uh, is to take my girls to dance class. And they're there for about four or five hours. I bring in a chair, I sit down and I get to change their shoes. And I just, I just love it. Just hanging out there, <laughs> being there. And my wife's like, you're nuts. You know, she can't sit for anything. It'll drive her crazy. But I'm like, it's just my time to be with them, you know, be with their friends. And I just soak it up and enjoy it. You know, I, whenever I get those moments with them, I just try to make the best of it. That's awesome. Yeah. Hey, so I got a question for you. Um, with, you know, let's talk a little bit more about like Merch Crew. I know that you we talked about it sort of uh, infancy and how it got started and how it really kind of grew into something where you were more so servicing one particular organization, which was a large one, but, it, you know, so it kind of touched a certain circle of freelancers. But since then, you've uh, really kind of uh, grown that into more of a mature offering for the greater industry. I guess just Go ahead and tell us what is Merch Crew today. What was that look like? What um, what's your infrastructure like there, and and how are you sort of bringing that to the industry on the daily now? Yeah, well, we like I said, it came from you know a need, some an existing need that was out there, and, and I feel like the the big benefit we offer is we work the way the industry works. Everything else that's kind of I would consider a competitor of ours. They're always trying to force the industry into other un, other areas and trying to make things work. Like I said, the original company we, we took the business from, that's what they were doing, trying to make our industry work in an environment it didn't really work and, and you had frustrated contractors like Louie. Um, so we continue to focus on the rental and staging arena. We really focus on the contracting and payment side. I think that is the, the primary piece that we own and really nobody has uh, has been able to uh, capture the way that we have. Um, and then since then, we've started to kind of grow um, grow the other side of it. My end goal with Mertz Crew is we want to be a software platform that really handles your personnel and your labor on a show site from the beginning of when you need that role all the way to the end when the guy gets paid. And that doesn't matter whether he's an employee, a contractor, a third party contract or staffing company. We want you guys to see Mertz Crew as I need a lighting designer on this project and we're going to handle that from the beginning to the end. So we've taken the back end, which I think we've we've owned for a while, and we're now growing into uh, the scheduling side, um, alerting crew. So, you know, my end goal is you just look at your phone and you know exactly where you're working the next day and what needs to happen because it's in your calendar. Um, and then if there's updates, the schedulers can update that information and your schedule just automatically updates right there on your on your device. Um, so that's the, the vision and the end goal. We really want to help rental and staging companies. I think there's a lot of companies out there, software companies that focus on the equipment and managing the equipment and where the equipment needs to be. And they're dabbling in the... Uh, in the personnel side, but I think we do it better and we're really trying to focus on helping you manage your personnel for a project or an event in rental and staging. We want to own that. You know, and I can appreciate that. I've, as watching your, your company and your platform and your ideas grow, I love the website and having that profile on there and just being able to say what my skills are, having that rate set on there and then being able to list the jobs um, or see the list of jobs that are available. But then I've also had people contact me saying, hey, I saw your profile on uh, Merch Crew, wanted to check up and see if you were available these dates. It's, it's definitely made it a more user-friendly and a person-friendly, because people aren't gear. And I'm just totally against the idea of people just being shipped around like gear. But to see that option and to be contacted and the way that it all works together has been I, I, I've appreciated the way that everything's grown. I wanted to say that. No, oh, thank you. Yeah, and I, I truly look at it that way. I don't, you know, I, I have a, all these guys are freelancers. So to me, they're all individual businesses and they're mm -hmm. selling what they do, you know, and, and I, I can appreciate the guy who's really good at his job, but he's not very good at selling himself or getting his invoice out to get paid or managing his, his payment procedure. He just wants to be a video switcher because he's good at that. I mean, we have some guys that are so good at running a spider system, but we can't get an invoice from them via email. You know? <laughs> <laughs> what I mean because they're just yeah. so into what they do 
and they re and so that's what we want to become. We want to be that platform for these guys to continue to be the best spider operator they are, and then they can just get paid, you know, and they can do their gig and uh, and and show up to you know the project, do a great job managing the spider operator, and the rest of it is really as simple as possible. And then they get their pay uh, their their check, you know, in a timely manner, and they get paid, uh, and they have a guarantee that they're going to get paid, and don't have to worry about is this a producer that's going to stiff me on my pay or, or anything mm -hmm. like that, or or what are the terms of the deal, you know, with, you know, so many times when I was freelancing I started to come up with a deal memo because I thought a day rate meant this and they thought a day rate meant that and neither of them were really malicious it was just a nomenclature thing so we settle that now it's clear in your contract this is what you're going to get paid this is how you're going to get paid and you can either accept it or reject it and if you know you have that right to say no i'm not going to do that because you guys have adjusted the the payments differently and that's all on the front end it's all before you do the work it's such a bitter pill when you after you do this project you worked your butt off and then you find out they meant a day rate meant no overtime. You know what I mean? And you worked four 16 hour days, you know what I mean? And yeah. um, those kinds of things are what we want to avoid. We want to, we want to settle all that stuff up on the front end. So it's clear how you're getting paid. That's all. up, And then everybody walks away happy. You know, you, you were happy with the rate you, you did, you got paid the way you expected to get paid the amount of money there. Was, and then it shows up, you know, in your paycheck or in your bank account uh, in a timely manner that, that, that it was expected to be there. So um, we just want to settle all of that stuff so that there isn't this negativity. And, and trust me, I knew as a producer, and I've hired other freelancers, you know, there's some, some guys who've been stiff. There's some negative people out there. You see on LinkedIn, uh, uh, you know, chat rooms, people trying to kind of cover, hey, I never heard of this company. You know, do I have to worry about these types of things? These are real problems the guys have to worry about. And some of them, you know, it's, you know, they're, they're, they're looking for that next payment as soon as possible. So to take away and give some peace of mind uh, and some opportunities for these guys, I love that. I would love to continue to grow Mert's crew to give these people that I have. I love this industry. I have great camaraderie with most everybody in the, in the industry and, and to be able to provide some peace of mind for them that they can just go do their job and, and feel solid that their payment's going to be there and they know what they're going to get paid. That's that, those are all wins for us from at Merch crew. Now I have a, a question in regards to that. If I'm a freelancer, right, and I've been requested to work on a show by a, um, a company, they've reached out to me. Can I say that? Okay, I'll take, I'll do your job, but I get paid through Mertz Crew. Absolutely, and we have guys that we have guys uh, that do that. Yep, that's a little bit more. It's not as easy of a process as it is for companies that come to us and say, "Hey, we want to pay everybody through Mertz Crew," but we can mm -hmm. certainly do that. And we actually have that in our pipeline of you know it, we could get to a point where the a contractor's payment platform is just Mertz Crew, and he does all of his invoicing through Mertz Crew, regardless of who the client is. So those oh, are all nice. the types of things we're we're looking towards the future for. I have a question for you. How uh, you mentioned, you know, that the production company wants to hire a great spider op. How do they know that just because they're in your database that they're worth hiring in the first place? Or is there any sort of qualifying that goes on? In uh, the qualifying is all on the the department side. So, um, it, you know, if a company wants to hire a spider operator, they can certainly broadcast and say, hey, I'm looking for a spider operator. And they can limit, they only want it in a 25 mile hour, mile radius of this particular city, or they can open it up to the whole, uh, the whole database. Um, and then guys will propose or bid on it, basically. I can do that for this much money. And they can see on their profile if they've done that job or not. But we, we give them their email address and their phone number. So you can call. So, Stephen, if you put in for you know a video director job with a, a company that's never worked with you before, they'll have access to your resume and your phone number. And they can pick up the phone and chat with you and say, hey, have you done this? What what you know? What what gear have you worked on? What companies have you worked for? Um, so we give them a little bit of data, but ultimately they still have the opportunity to pick up the phone, talk to the contractor directly, vet them personally before they make any kind of movement. And it kind of we're not eliminating. 
we, we, I don't think we're getting to the point where it's like Uber, where you just get a video director and the most, <laughs> the, the one that's available right. shows up. I mean, it would be nice to get to that point, but the skill set's a little bit more involved than driving a car. You know what I mean? So um, it would be nice to get that. But most people, we're, we're, we're kind of eliminating, hey, I've gone through my five guys that I have that are spider operators. None of them are available. And what do most people do at that point? They start asking for referrals from somebody. Hey, can you refer me to a spider operator that you might know? Um, and that, you know, this allows them at least to open up the, the arena to say, hey, maybe there's somebody else out there that I don't know. But you still got to vet them. You still want to check their 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 references and their their resume and just even just have a chat with them just to get the personality correct. The two that questions. I know that sense. I noticed on the site that there is a uh, like a star system. How are those rated? And then also, are, do people have access to see some of your show history, your old shows that are on the, your site as well? Yeah, you can only see uh, show history of the client if it's within a company that you've worked with. So you have, um, yeah, you know, and we, we try to, there's some concern and validly, you know, some con companies don't want their contractors that they vetted to be available to the rest of the world that might be their competitors. So they have mm -hmm. ability to build a fence around their contractors that nobody has access to, which is, which is fine. We can do that. But if you have a contractor who's joined uh, publicly, you know what I mean? And they're available to the public and they've come to the site, you know, their own way, then they're available to the rest of it. Um, if they're open to other companies, you can see what jobs they have done or what roles they have done and what they were rated on those roles, but you can't see what show it was. Like, uh, because we don't want to allow other rental and staging companies to know those shows exist to try and poach, you know, a potential show from another client. So that's the reasons for those types of protections. Um, but you can see the guy was a spider operator five times and he got a 4.7 rating on those five times. That's a pretty good indicator that he's probably a, a pretty good spider operator. You know what I mean? Now, um, yeah, now, now, like Uber, when you complete a ride, you have to give a rating. So do companies actually, is there a forced rating system for you, um, or do people just have the option to rate technicians? Yes, we have a, it, it is forced, but the default is a four star. So if there's a company that kind of doesn't want to deal with the, the rating system or it's too long or tedious, um, the, the four is kind of the, the average or the go-to. Um, and, and then what we're giving them is the opportunity, basically, do you want to adjust the four? We assume everybody on a level playing field, if you have nothing to say about them, they're all four star uh, roles. But say a guy did an extra, you know, amazing job and you really want to give him something else, then they have the opportunity to bump him up to five stars. Or if they were somebody that you really want to call out that we had a problem with him and you want to let the other schedulers and the other people know, then you have the opportunity to knock them down. So there's a lot of guys who are frustrated with the four star, but I would say, you know, the, the four star is, is a good thing. It means you did your gig. They're willing to use you again. Uh, there's nothing negative that's really happened. Um, and, and you should be proud of that. I love it. I love that. Uh, you know, Joe, what you guys are basically doing is is defining, you know, or at least taking the first swing at sort of defining some of these new rules uh, and ways that uh, the industry can sort of assess, right? Whether it's that, for, like, that's great. It's not exactly that it's uh, perfect. It's more that someone's got a thought around it and you guys are implementing it and then you'll learn, right? That software, you'll, you'll run it out there. You'll see how it, how the sort of, you know, collective industry responds to it. And then you build off of that. And, uh, I like any aspect of software that has that more, uh, user contribution side to it where the community is able to sort of source and define those stars, define those reviews, define those things. I think that's generally uh, something that's for the better and not for the worse. So that's cool stuff, man. Thank you. Yeah, we've had some people who are a little nervous about it and, and I get that. Uh, I know that there are, there are other, you know, some of those equipment softwares, they have uh, rating systems as well, but they're closed. What I kind of like about ours is you get to see uh, some, re some response, you know what I mean? If you consistently are getting three stars, 
you know, it, it, you got to take that and go, wait a minute, what, you know, is there something I'm not doing, something I have to pay attention to, something's not right here, maybe I need to self-reflect and take a look and see what's, what's going on or reach out and try to find out what you can do better. So I, th- I agree. I think it's all good stuff that allows people to continue to grow and get better at their, at their skill set. Well, for anybody who's interested, you can uh, learn more at Mertz Crew, M-E-R-T-Z Crew.com. Um, they got videos and they got contact and get a hold of Joe. And then I think Gabe, right? Gabe's the other contact there yep. for Mertz Crew. Um, Joe, we got to wrap, buddy. But uh, thank you. This was awesome. No, my, really pl- my pleasure. It was great talking to you guys. Uh, just in general for everybody out there please uh, if you know of anybody else that would be a great candidate someone to have on to the production uh, channel even if it's yourself if you got great stories about kind of what your side of the industry looks like that's what we're doing here we want to bring these stories to uh, the industry so with that J- thanks Joe thanks Clem I appreciate you guys and we'll catch you next week on the production channel chatter chatter